All right. Good evening, everybody. Welcome. We are so glad that you guys are here. and We're so glad that everybody's joining us at all of our campuses. Welcome. For everybody that's joining us online, welcome. We're so glad that you're here. I'm going to ask our team in the back, if you guys could, Tyler, I'm sorry, I'm just throwing this at you. Can you get the phone number up? So can we, if we could put that phone number up right quick. So we're so excited. How many of you guys enjoyed Beckett this morning? Just come on. It was awesome. So it was so great to get to have Beckett with us and so excited that he was able to come and share with us this morning. And if you didn't get a chance to hear, what Beckett shared with us this morning was his testimony. You know, Beckett lived a large portion of his life as a gay man. So once he kind of got out of high school, and then 13 years ago, he had a radical encounter with God, a radical encounter with the Holy Spirit, and his life has been forever transformed. He went on to Talbot University, got a master's in theology, has written an incredible book, uh, which we have available. Actually, can you hand me that book right quick, quickly? I want to hold that up so everybody can get this. So this is Beckett's uh, book. It is a change of affection, a gay man's incredible story of redemption with a forward by Francis Chan. So I want to encourage you, if you didn't have a chance to get this this morning, to make sure you get yourself a copy of this book. Beckett also has an incredible podcast. You can just go to any of the podcast platforms, look up Beckett Cook, and you'll be able to see his podcast. It comes out every week. I was sharing this morning that as I was trying to really learn something about the whole homosexual issue and really understand it from the perspective of somebody who's been transformed. Because part of it is, you, you know, you can't really understand what somebody's been through unless you've been through it yourself, right? And if you've had that struggle and gone through that. So it was, it's been really a blessing to me and really helpful to me to be able to listen to Beckett, listen to his podcast, hear him as he's interviewing folks and uh, dealing with different authors and different thought leaders on the subject. And it's really helped me get a much better understanding of our culture and the things that we have to deal with in our culture. And it's just, I just love that our God is a transforming God. Isn't that amazing? That God can bring trans, yeah, we can get God for that, that he can bring transformation. And so this evening, so here's the number. So all throughout the evening, as Beckett is sharing, if you guys have any questions, in fact, if you would, would you just pull out your cell phones right now and go ahead and get this number in there? You can go ahead and do that. That way you've got the number logged in there. If you have a question, if the Holy Spirit prompts you, please ask that. We've got a team in the back that is sorting through those. So kind of the sooner you get your question in, the probably the better chance we're going to have to answer. And this goes for all of our campuses as well. If you have a question you want to uh, see us address this evening, you can type that in. Becca's going to share with us for about 30, 40 minutes. And then at the end of that, uh, Kim and I will be up and we'll go into our Q&A section. So let me just pray to open up our evening and then we'll have Beckett come up with us. So Father, we're just so thankful for you. And God, we're thankful for your love and for your grace. We're thankful for the transforming work of the cross and how it does change us. It transforms us and it shifts us. And God, we just pray tonight. I just pray for blessings of energy and life on Beckett as he shares with us again. And just thank you for us as a community that we can come together as a church community to understand this subject more and to be able to be more compassionate ministers in our community. So we just thank you for tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, will you guys help me welcome Beckett one more time? Come on up here, brother. Thank you. Awesome, man. Thank you. So glad you... Well, I'm back. Welcome back, guys. So I want to take you on a journey tonight. Um, and let's see. Let me just pull this up. Oh, I got to do this. Is this working? Oh, there it is. Okay. So I want to kind of go through the history of how we got to where we are today in terms of LGBTQ ideology. And we could go back to the sexual revolution of the 60s, but I'm going to take us further back to uh, the 18th century. And we're going to start with a philosopher, French philosopher, or Genevan philosopher, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, whose ideas uh, were so radical and they still, they, his ideas impact us so deeply today that is it's quite shocking and I, I in my mind you know next to Adam and Eve's transgression in the garden that plunged the world into chaos he comes in a close second Rousseau Jean-Jacques Rousseau and um, before I start I just a lot of 
some, some of the, the stuff I'm, I, I'm gonna talk about comes from Carl Truman's fantastic book, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. It's, I highly recommend it. He has a shorter version called uh, A Strange New World. But I wanna talk about how did we go from homosexual behavior becoming, an, how did it become an identity over the last de many decades? How did it become an identity? How did homosexual behavior become normalized in our culture? How did the statement, I am a man, I am a woman trapped in a man's body, not only become normal in our current culture, but become celebrated and sometimes mandatory to affirm? There, and, if, and, and it could actually cost you your job or your livelihood if you don't affirm that. So how did these things happen? How did this happen over the last 250 years? Because we're going to go back to Rousseau. So let's start with him. Jean-Jacques Rousseau was from Geneva, 18th century philosopher. His ideas were the progenitor to the French Revolution, which... If you know anything about the, the French Revolution in 1789, and if you know anything about this for French Revolution, it was an unmitigated disaster. Um, Robespierre, who was the leader of the revolution and the Jacobins, not only did they, was there a reign of terror where they slaughtered, guillotined thousands and thousands and thousands of people, but they themselves in the end were also guillotined. And, so the revolution ate itself. And the, and, and, and the revolution was anti-God. The French Revolution was anti-God. Robespierre marched into the, in Notre Dame in Paris, and he declared Notre Dame the temple of reason. So they, they wanted to get rid of religion. They wanted a 10-day week instead of a 7-day week. But so Rousseau's ideas were very much a part of that, the French Revolution. And you may know... His famous phrase is, man is born free, but everywhere in chains. And what that means is, man in the state of nature. Now, his man, like, think, of, think of kind of like a caveman. Man in the state of nature is free. But, he, but as soon as he enters into society, and this is a hypothetical man. This was kind of a thought experiment for Rousseau. This wasn't a historical man. But his idea was... Man is free, but as soon as he enters into society, society corrupts him because society compels him to do things that he is not natural to him. So the sexual mores of society, the, um, all of the traditional mores of the society compel that man to, to go against his, his true authentic self, which is what we see pl playing out today. It's all about authentic, authenticity, being who you are, be true to yourself. This is all Rousseauian thought. And so his, that man, that man of nature, he called the noble savage. And again, uh, and he thought that humans were intrinsically good. So he thought man was born good, but was corrupted by society. And... It's interesting because, so there's two, two men who, there's the Rousseauians and then Augustin, Augustinians. So St. Augustine from the uh, fourth and fifth century, uh, he was one of the early church fathers in the West. And it, you, the world can be divided into Augustinians and Rousseauians. And I'll explain why, because there are two, they both, Rousseau and Augustine, wrote autobiographies, which were very unusual, especially in the day of Augustine, it was very unusual to do. And they were both called confessions. And we're going to talk about the difference between pears and asparagus, because this, it's fruits and vegetables. The difference between pears and asparagus is fundamental to what is happening today in culture. It's absolutely fundamental. And so in, in Augustine's Confessions, he talks about how he was, one, one night he was with a group of friends when he was young, and they were, you know, kind of being 
young, crazy teenagers, and they stole pears from a neighbor's garden. And they didn't do it because the pears were nice, because they weren't very nice and they weren't tasty. And in fact, Rousseau had nicer pears in his own garden. They did it just for the fun of it, just for the thrill of stealing the pears. And so when, when Augustine is reflecting on this later, he realizes that man, that he's, he's wicked by nature, that he's sinful by nature. And that's why uh, Augustine is the one who developed the, the idea of original sin. That was, that was from Augustine. And so Augustine blamed himself for the stealing of the pears. He didn't blame society. And he knew that, Augustine knew that man was born sinful, that man has a wicked heart by nature, that were by nature sinners. That was Augustine. Now, Rousseau, on the other hand, was the complete opposite. So and Rousseau, similar thing, wrote an uh, autobiography called Confessions, and he stole asparagus. And the reason he stole the asparagus is because a local man named Monsieur, Monsieur Verat asked him to steal the asparagus so Verat could sell it and make some money. So Rousseau steals the asparagus and he later reflects on this whole event and he realizes that he stole the asparagus. His desire to steal it was basically a good one because it was to help this man, Verat. And he, Rousseau, believed that th this act was not, he was not intrinsically sinful, but he was corrupted by Verat. He was corrupted by this man who compelled him or asked him to steal the asparagus. And so for, for Rousseau in this moment, he realized it was society that is to blame, not himself. So his, his stealing of the asparagus wasn't his fault. It was the fault of society. It was the fault of Verat who asked him to do this. And you, we'll get more into this later, but Rousseau, these ideas of Rousseau's that man is born good and, and it's society's fault, it's society to blame for, for man's ills, has such an impact today on everything from, from education to, to debates on crime and punishment to, uh, to, and then the purpose for Rousseau, the purpose of education, because it's all about being your, it's all about going back to that state of nature, being your authentic self. So for Rousseau, the purpose of education is because he thinks children are inherently good. So the purpose of education is to promote self-esteem, develop authenticity, not to educate, but to just develop self-esteem and help them to become more and more authentic, which is what we're seeing playing out today, 250 years later, in a very strong way. And then we get to the romantic poets of the, of the same similar period, and Percy B. Shelley, William Wordsworth, w William Blake were these, well, these are examples of, of romantic poets. And this was a particular strain of romanticism, which was an artistic movement. And this strain was called uh, expressivism. And um, I, I, met, I think I mentioned this earlier today, but Percy B. Shelley said that poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. And what he meant by that was, uh, through our work, we are changing culture. And culture, politics is always downstream of culture, right? So whatever happens in culture eventually happens in politics. And so he understood, Percy B. Shelley understood that, uh, that they had, poets had a powerful effect on culture. And, of course, we know that today. Who are the unacknowledged legislators of today? The people in Hollywood who create the content that we imbibe and that shape us and form us. And like all of, we'll get to this later, all of the, the, the movies and the TV shows and from the 60s on that have shaped what we believe about not only this issue, but about a host, whole host of issues. 
And so um, Shelley had contempt, contempt for traditional sexual mores. He, he, he thought Christianity was evil. Um, he thought sexual codes of the day were unnatural constraints and they led to inauthenticity, which we see today, which comes, goes back to Rousseau. So we're, it's, if, you, if you can't express your sexual desires, you're being inauthentic. You're not being true to yourself. And he thought sexual liberation is essential to political libera liberation. He also, um, he thought the purpose of life is personal happiness. And he defines that as a pleasurable sensation. So that's the, the purple, purpose of life is, is a pleasurable sensation. And of course, that's what our culture is all about today. What, whatever gives me the most pleasure, that's what I'm gonna pursue. It, regardless of what kind of harm it does to the, the society at large or harm it does to myself or to the other person, we're gonna pursue that because we wanna be authentic. He said that marriage is for mutual pleasure and satisfaction, and once those are gone, the marriage should be dissolved, which of course leads to no-fault divorce in our day. And he, he really hated marriage. Uh, and, and again, it's like, that, we see that in marriage today. It's all about quid pro quo. If, if, you're, if I'm not getting what I want and I'm kind of unhappy, well, then I'm gonna leave because I'm no longer satisfied. And we see that, and I talk about this all the time on my show, but once marriage is, is attacked and destroyed, everything else, it's like, again, it's a domino effect. And, that it leads to all kinds of societal ills, homelessness, uh, mental illness, um, all kinds of uh, depression, anxiety. Uh, so broken families lead to all kinds of societal ills, Cry, uh, you know, incar mass incarceration, and the list goes on and on and on. This is all Rousseau and, and these, these uh, poets. And Shelley, because he, because he believes marriage is just for pleasure. This sets, up, this sets the stage for gay marriage today. So way back, way back in the 18th century, uh, he was already setting the stage. And I just wanna read one of William Blake's poems it's called The Garden of Love. And talk about this poem because it's, it's really powerful. Um, he says, I went to the garden of love, and I saw what I, what I had never seen. I'm sorry, and I saw what I, I never had seen. A chapel was built in the midst where I used to play on the green, and the gates of, the cha of this chapel were shut, and thou shalt not writ over the door. So I turned to the garden of love that so many sweet flowers bore, and I saw it was filled with graves and tombstones where flowers should be, and priests in black gowns were walking their rounds, and binding with briars my joys and desires. So in this poem, William Blake is saying, he, the chapel in the, is a man-made intrusion into the garden of what was once innocent, innocence. So the chapel is disruptive. The, in other words, Christ, faith and Christianity and God, faith in God is disruptive to this garden, this innocent garden. And the, the chapel, its presence is both alien and oppressive in the garden. And, and notice that he picks up on the Decalogue, on the Ten Commandments, the, when he says, thou shalt not writ over the door. And it's a, the, when he does that, it's kind of, he's conveying this negative, life-denying nature of Christian morality. And he's saying that, he's saying, basically in this poem, he's saying religion especially in particular Christianity, because this was the dominant religion in Europe at the time. So religion is oppressive, and it denies us of our real humanity. So these are the romantic poets. So when you, when you see movies like the De Dead Poet Society, it's all about this. Dead Poet Society is all about... They, I don't know if you remember the character, Robert Sean Leonard, he played, he committed suicide because he couldn't... 
he, his father wouldn't allow him to be an actor because, so basically, he, he, could, he committed suicide because he couldn't be his authentic self. And this all goes back to these guys. And they were reading romantic poets in, the, uh, in that movie. And then we get to, of course, the, the crazy madman, Friedrich Nietzsche. And Nietzsche obviously was famous for saying God is dead. Um, and if you read that whole passage from The Gay Science, it's, it's quite, it's chilling. Um, because he's not so much saying God is dead, let's celebrate. He's saying the enlightenment has killed God and now there's a vacuum and what are we gonna put in its place? And what's, what's gonna happen now that God is dead? And we see that, we see what's happening. And he knew that enlightenment philosophy rendered God implausible and unnecessary. And again, that leaves a, not only a moral vacuum, but a teleological vacuum, Tele meaning we have no purpose. There's no purpose to life if God is dead. We have no purpose. So what's gonna fill that vacuum? All sorts of crazy things. And he, he, he says basically when you kill God, you, become, you must become your own God. And we see that, of course, now, just for example, with the, the use of pronouns, when, or, you, or calling yourself non-binary. You're playing, when you do that, or when you become transgender, you're playing God. You're creating, you're your own God, and you're creating yourself. Instead of God creating you, you're creating yourself. And it's, it's a very dangerous game to play when you play God. It's very, very dangerous. It leads to all sorts of destruction. And so Nietzsche de denies any claims of traditional authority. And in Carl Truman's book, he, he talks about an Ariana Grande concert. And he says, an average 12-year-old 12, 12 girl attending an Ariana Grande concert may have never heard of Nietzsche, but the amoral sexual, sexuality of, of her lyrics preaches a form of Nietzscheism. So these young girls, these young teenage girls have no idea who Nietzsche is, but that's what she's preaching with her, her songs and her lyrics. And then of course we get to Karl Marx, my favorite. Uh, he, he wrote the Communist Manifesto with Engels. And it's always the German and the French who really mess up the world, right? <laughs> I, don't know what, I don't know what it is about these guys. They really had some, uh, some major problems. And um, of course, with, with Marx, Marxism was all about class struggle between the bourgeoisie, the proletariat, the ruling class, and the working class. So this class struggle. And for him, history was all about, dialect he called it dialectical materialism. It was all about these struggles and the resolutions. Struggles, resolutions. So history was just made up these str with struggles and resolutions. Of course, Marx believed that utopia was possible on this earth. That's why he wrote the Communist Manifesto. And when you read, you know, when you're an innocent freshman in college and you read the Communist Manifest Manifesto, you're like, wow, this is amazing. I remember thinking that. I was like, this is, my gosh, like we, this is perfect. Why can't, why can't we do this? And again, the reason com Marxism or communism doesn't work in reality is because we're Augustinian because we are sinful by nature. He doesn't account, he doesn't take that into account. He believes the Rousseauian view that man is born good. So if you believe that man is born good, you believe that utopia is possible on earth. Utopia is not ever possible on earth until Christ returns. That's the only time that's gonna happen. When he comes back, there's gonna be a new heavens and new earth and that will be utopia. But before then, there's no absolutely no possibility of utopia. No matter how many political ways we try to, 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 to uh, slice it, it's not going to work. We tried it in the 20th century. Millions and millions of people were killed in the name of this utopia, in the name of communism. Stalin, Pol Pot, Mao, Chairman Mao. I mean, millions and millions of people. It was the deadliest century. And Marx famously said, religion is the sigh 
of the oppressed culture, or of the oppressed creature, the heart of a heartless world, and the soul of, a, of soulless conditions. It is the opium of the people. So he thought religion was the opium of the people. And with, with Marx, everything becomes political. So there's, uh, the, the, there's no longer just the personal life. There, everything is political. And we see that today. I mean, Boy Scouts. It, it, <laughs> everything's political today. Cake baking. Baking a wedding cake is political. Selling flowers is political. Uh, everything has become political. And this goes back to Marx. He also wanted to abolish the family. He and Engels wanted to abolish the nuclear family, nuclear family, because the nuclear family is hierarchical, right? There's the father and mother at top and the children. And that, that uh, was uh, a representation of the hier hierarchy of society, of the ruling class and the working class. So they wanted to get rid of the family because the, he didn't like, especially Engels, they, they didn't like the hierarchical structure of the family. And it's, it's funny because Marx's father was, I think he was a Protestant pre minister, a preacher. And, um, and for Marx, religion offers a false happiness to an unhappy world. So it's, it's just, it's, he, he hated Christianity. He hated God. And then, of course, the, we get to Charles Darwin, who um, wrote on the origin of species and had, you know, came up with a theory of evolution. And this Darwin, Darwinianism was really the death blow to any kind of teleology, any kind of purpose in life. Because Darwin's theory was basically that we're here by natural selection and random mutation. Human beings where we, we've descended from apes or just a higher form of primates and we're, you know, basically time plus chance plus matter and we're here by random, random mutation and natural selection. And so this and God, this rendered God completely irrelevant. So God was not the creator. God was no longer a creator. We just happened by accident to be here. And what all we have is the material world there is no transcendent world. Um, and he, he eliminated the notion of human exceptionalism. He eliminated the Imago Dei on human beings, so the image of God. So we, as we know from, from, from the word of God, from scripture, we know that human beings are created in the image of God. And so that gives us value that gives us worth, that gives us dignity as humans. But if you take that away, there's zero basis for dignity or rights or worth. So our whole world is, our whole, the whole Western world is Darwinian. So where, do, so where do we get human rights from? There are no human rights. According to Darwin, the stronger eats the weak. So why, there should be, like Harvey Weinstein that's just the stronger eating the weak. No one should be protesting that. If you're, if you're not, if you don't, if you're a Darwinian, then why would you protest that? It's just the strong eating the weak. It's just like animals in nature. We're just animals in the wild. So Darwin had a devastating effect on, on culture. And so he, Nietzsche, Dar Marx, and Darwin believed that humans were plastic people that we're moldable, that we're not, we don't have a fixed nature. We don't have an, we don't have an intrinsic essence. And that's very crucial because we actually do have an intrinsic essence. We are created in the image of God. We, because of the fall, we're sinful by nature. And if you take those things out of the equation, you're left with a mess. And it reminds me of the quote, this, all of this reminds me of G.K. Chesterton's, Chesterton's quote, when, man, when men choose not to believe in God, they do not thereafter believe in nothing. They then become capable of believing in anything. And that's where we are today. We can just believe whatever we want. Everything's subjective. There's no objective truth out there. It's all internal. Whatever my feelings are, that's the truth. 
It's my truth, you have your truth, I have my truth, it's all subjectivism. And all of, all of these ideas, ideas have consequences, and all these ideas from all these guys I've been talking about have come home to roost in a very strong way in our culture. And of course we get to my, my all-time favorite, Sigmund Freud from Vienna. Sigmund Freud was the father of, of psychoanalysis. Um, I actually studied Freud in Vienna when I went to school there. And I mean, his ideas, <laughs> First of all, Freud was obsessed with sex, absolutely obsessed. Everything was sexual. He thought human beings at their core were sexual, that we are sexual beings at our core. That was the most important thing about us. And he thought that religion was a psychological need, what he would call a wish fulfillment. He thought religion was a wish fulfillment. And he, his, he thought that the goal for, for human beings was to be happy, which he came, and he came up with this idea of the pleasure principle. And what the pleasure principle was, was what made you happy was genital pleasure. So Freud was all about sex and all about genital pleasure. And any, any time you try to suppress that, and if you don't act out on that desire, then you're suppressing your authentic self. Again, going back to Rousseau. And he thought morality was irrational and subjective. Uh, and then, of course, this has huge effects on sex education. Freud believed that children were, by, at birth, sexual. So children are sexual from birth. And so that's why we see the sex education at younger and younger and younger ages in schools. And he wrote, his famous essay is called Civilization and Its Discontents. And what that title means, civilization, he could, because Freud thought that, that religion actually was good at curbing deep, dark sexual urges that would kind of undo society. So he knew that religion was necessary to kind of hold society together, but, or hold civilization together, but he also knew that if you couldn't act on those desires, then there would be discontent. You would be discontented. So that's why it's called civilization and it's discontents. So for Freud, we're in this constant state of frustration, and, and more specifically, in, in a constant state of sexual frustration, because we can't act out on our id, he had this, these three ideas, the super, super ego, the ego, and the id. And the id was your kind of primal drive, your instinctual primal animalistic drive. And so if you couldn't act out on your id, you were suppressing your authenticity. And then, and now I want to turn to kind of a, time, a timeline of more specifically, the gay movement, the LGBTQ movement. And so, in 1924, uh, it was the first, the first gay rights, I'm, I'm sorry, the, yeah, the first gay rights organization was established in America by this guy, um, Harry, I'm sorry, uh, Henry Gerber. And this, this is in 1924, and it was called the Society for Human Rights. started in Chicago, and they published a homosexual newsletter called Friendship and Freedom. And then in 1949, Simone de Beauvoir, who, uh, she was, uh, Simone de Beauvoir was, again, a French philosopher, and she was married, she, I don't know if she was married to um, Jean-Paul Sartre, Jean -Paul Sartre Jean-Paul Sartre, I don't know if they were married, but they were partners. And Jean-Paul Sartre was an existentialist. And Simone de Beauvoir, and she, when she wrote, she wrote a book called The Second Sex. And that was kind of the first time where gender became separated from biological sex. Because in her book, she says, one is not born, but rather becomes a woman. And 
She, in the book, she states, although that there, there are biological differences between the sexes, women only become women because of the circumstances of their society. Again, Rousseau. Leading her to the conclusion, leading Beauvoir to the conclusion that the facts of biology take on the values of social norms. So this is kind of the first sort of uh, inklings of, of, of gender being separated from biological sex. And then in 1950, the Harry Hay, who uh, was a gay activist in Los Angeles, started a homosexual organization called the Mattachine in Silver, in Silver Lake. Silver Lake is where I had the coffee where I met the people with the Bibles. And back in the early 20th century, Silver Lake was the gay community in, in, uh, it's in Los Angeles. Now it's, West, most, and now it's all spread out, but, and then it became West Hollywood, but back in the day it was Silver Lake. That was where gays and lesbians really, uh, that was the, the, their community. And so Mattachine uh, was, was started in Silver Lake, and then there was a lesbian group called Daughter, Daughters of Velitis that was started by a, a group of women in San Francisco in 1951. And uh, they're, they're, it, this is a, just kind of an interesting fact. The group's name came from a French poem called Songs of Velitis, published in 1894 by, French author, by a French author. And he, the author claimed that the, the poem was written by a Greek courtesan who was a contemporary of an ancient Greek female poet, Sappho. So the Greek island Lesbos was the home of Sappho, who had sexual relations with women as well as men, hence the term lesbian. So lesbian comes from this, this, this island Lesbos. And the Daughters of Belitis published a, a lesbian magazine called The Ladder, indicating that the, mag the magazine's purpose was to encourage lesbians to pull themselves up the ladder of social tolerance. So that was in 1951. In 1968, this was a big deal. Oh, uh, oh and, and of course, the sexual revolution of the 1960s. Um, that was a big deal. That's when, you know, so our, in, in, in this country, that we threw off the shackles of any kind of s traditional sexual mores or codes, and for in a in, in a large part, and and the sexual revolution again, the sexual revolution didn't cause the sexual revolution. The sexual revolution was caused by all of these people I have been talking about for the last whatever how, how, however long. But um, so this, the sexual revolution had a radical impact on the culture in the 60s. And then in 1968, Frank Kameny, a New Yorker, coined the slogan, gay is good. Now, that may seem innocent now, but at the time, that was a radical thing to say. Nobody would say such a thing. But in, in 1968, he coined this term, gay is good, and it caught on. It was very... Shocking at the time, and it was a very powerful thing to, to say at the time. And then in 1969, this was kind of, this is really where the gay movement took off. The Stonewall Inn in New York, which is a gay bar, which I've been to many times, well, not many times, a handful of times before I was a Christian. It's in the West Village. And in 1969, in the, on June 28th, in the early hours of the, of the morning, at like 1.30 in the morning, po the police raided the bar and arrested several gay men, and that sparked these riots. And the riots lasted for three days. And this was really, that sparked the gay, this really sparked the gay movement in, 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 uh, in a big, big way. And in 1970, uh, Christopher Street Gay Liberation Day was kind of the first gay pride uh, day. And this was to commemorate what happened the year before in June of June 28th. And that's why gay pride is in June. 
uh, because of this. And Christopher Street is a, is a street in the West Village. It's basically a gay street in the West Village. And so this is gay pride. So in 1970, there were gay pride marches, as they used to be called, in Los Angeles, New York, and San Francisco, and I think Chicago. And uh, it used to be a day, and now it's a month. And actually, it's more of like a year now. <laughs> I mean, where I live in LA, it's like, it's a year long. It's like, it's gay pride is a year. And, um, and then on, oh, and then, so I want to just kind of get into some of the key, I mean, this is a, obviously, this isn't exhaustive. There are so many other shows and movies, but I just want to go through some key turning points in terms of media. But in 1977, the, the TV show, it was a primetime sitcom, basically, called Soap, starring Bill, and one of the stars was Billy Crystal, who, you know who Billy Crystal is, like Sleepless in Seattle, that guy. And it was the first show, it, was, it became the first fit sitcom to feature an openly gay character. And I remember as a kid watching this show, I, I saw this episode where he comes out of the closet. And it, was, it had such a strange impact on me when I was a kid. I remember just feeling all sorts of kind of like, whoa, this is so weird and dark and crazy and interesting and strange. And, and so slowly but surely, Hollywood is starting to normalize homosexual behavior and making, and making gay characters visible on shows. And then in 1978, Harvey Milk was uh, the first openly gay candidate in California to be, to be elected to public office. And he was elected to the, to the Board of Supervisors. And Harvey Milk was a gay activist. And he was assassinated. So there was another guy on the Board of Supervisors named Dan White. And Dan White hated the mayor, Mayor Moscone. He hated, hated Harvey Milk. He was jealous of him. It wasn't really, it wasn't really a, um, he wasn't, Dan White didn't kill Harvey Milk because he was gay. It was, it was honestly because he, he was jealous of him. So Dan White gets fired from his job and he, Dan White was mentally unwell, but he, um, he gets fired and then he, walk, he goes the next day into the mayor's office and shoots the mayor twice and kills him. And then he leaves the mayor's office, walks down the hall, goes into Harvey Milk's office and, sh and kills him, shoots him. And it was a huge scandal, obviously. And, and then Harvey Milk ended up becoming a gay icon. And in 2008, the, the movie Milk came out starring Sean Penn about his life. Actually, my friend, a very close friend of mine from back in the day, wrote the screenplay to this and he won the Oscar for this movie. And, um, and, and of course, this movie had a huge impact on, on our culture in terms of homosexuality. And in 1979, an estimated 75,000 people participated in the National March on Washington for lesbian and gay rights. And so things are starting to really move and shift in the culture and it's becoming political. Again, pol politics are downstream of culture. So, you know, the TV shows, the first it's the TV shows and then it's politics. And then in 1981, the New York Times prints the first story on a rare pneumonia and skin cancer found in 41 gay men in New York and San Francisco. Uh, and it was first called GRID, the acronym GRID, which was, stood for Gay Related Immune Deficiency Disorder. And then, of course, they changed the name to AIDS. Uh, and so this, this time, I, I remember this time as a kid. I mean, I, I remember it well. And um, this became, AIDS became a rallying cry. It became a political tool for the gay movement, and it, it became a very strong tool for the gay movement. And in 1987, the group, Larry Kramer, who was a gay activist in New York, he recently died, he started the group ACT UP. 
And ACT UP was a very militant gay activist group. And they, ACT UP stood for the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. And it was formed in response to the devastating effects of the disease on, uh, on the gay community in New York. And ACT UP brought so much attention to the gay cause, the gay movement, and homosexuality. And then in 1989, these two guys from Harvard who graduated from Harvard wrote this book called After the Ball, How America Will Conquer Its Fear and Hatred of Gays in the 90s. And this, After the Ball, their name is Marshall, their names are Marshall Kirk and Hudson, or Hunter Matson. And this book, it's so funny, you know, this, I'll read a couple quotes from the book. Uh, it's out of print now, it's really hard to find. But there, this was basically a manifesto. It was a playbook on how to get, how to normalize homosexual behavior in America. That's what their goal was. And they had very, very specific strategies. And you'll laugh when I read um, a couple of their quotes. He's, they say, it's time to learn from Madison Avenue to roll out the big guns. Gays must launch a large-scale campaign. We've called it waging, the Waging Peace Campaign to reach straights through the mainstream media. We're talking about propaganda. And he goes on, they say, the purpose of and effect of pro-gay propaganda is to promote a climate of an increased tolerance for homosexuals. That, and that, we say, is good. And he said, they say propaganda relies more upon emotional manipulation than upon logic, since its goal is, in fact, to bring about change in, in the public's feelings. And I'll just read a couple, one, one or two more quotes. Um, they say, the, the main thing is to talk about gayness until the issue becomes thoroughly tiresome. <laughs> Has it become thoroughly tiresome at this point? I think so. <laughs> I'm exhausted by it. Um, and, oh, he ta he, they talk about churches, Christian churches. They say, gays can undermine the moral authority of homo-hating churches over less fervent adherence by portraying such institutions as antiquated backwaters, badly out of step with the times, and with the latest findings of psychology. Um, and the last thing I'll say is, they say, in any campaign to win over the public, gays must be portrayed as victims in need of protection so that straights will be inclined by reflex to adopt the role of protector. So, I mean, the book is, is out of control. These guys were wild. And, um, and then after, after the ball, in 1990, Judith Butler, who is a feminist, and uh, she wrote a book called Gender Trouble. She really, Judith Butler was really successful at breaking the link between biological sex and gender. And she said that, that gender is, quote, flexible, free-floating, and not caused by other stable factors. So... We can thank Judith Butler for, for what's happening today with all the, the trans madness. And um, she said that the idea of identity as, uh, was, she called it performat per performative, or that, that gender was performative. So whatever you wanted to uh, present as is what your gender was. And we see that today. I can, I can just call myself a woman now and um, present as a woman, and you, you have to accept that. Um, so, the, and her, so her ideas were the foundation of queer theory, as it's called. And in 1997, Ellen DeGeneres had a sitcom before her talk show called Ellen, and she was the first openly lesbian actress to play an openly lesbian character on television. And this was a big deal. I remember watching the episode where <laughs> she came out on the show. And it was actually a very funny episode. 
And, uh, and this, this had a giant impact on culture. And of course, the next year she was on the cover of Time Magazine. Yep, I'm gay. And so, so you see this slow progression going on in culture, step by step, it's all happening. And then in 1998, Will and Grace becomes a huge hit. I know the creators of, I've been to the creators of house of Will and Grace. Um, I knew, I was friends with some of the, the guys on Will and Grace. And this show was major in the culture because <clears throat> here are these hilarious gay guys and these women who are, you know, they play off of. And it's like, these guys are hilarious and they're so fun and funny. And, you know, how could, how in the world now, how could homosexual behavior be wrong? I mean, these, it's just like, they're, they're so much fun. So you see how persuasive, I mean, the most persuasive, storytelling is the most persuasive means of persuasion. If I can say that. Storytelling is so powerful. Um, I mean, you could write books, or you could write books, or you could write essays, or pass out pamphlets on things, but that doesn't really change people's hearts. What changed people's minds and hearts are, is storytelling. And these are very powerful stories. And in 1998, Sex and the City also came out. I knew the creator of Sex and the City, Darren Starr. And, uh, and it's funny because the show, and especially in the beginning, it was written by mostly gay men whom I knew in L.A. And so the char- it was, it was, this, was, this was the kind of uh, behind-the-scenes thing about the show is the gay men who were creating the show and wrote the show wanted to make these women basically gay men. <laughs> if you notice in the, in, the, in the show, these women we're all about one night stands and sex and with sex whenever, with whomever, wherever, however they wanted. And that's, that's a very gay male kind of concept. And, and so Sex and the City became a huge smash hit. And then of course there were like multiple movies afterwards too. And then Kim Cattrall ruined the party. And then in April of 2000, Vermont becomes the first state in the US to legalize civil unions. In 2003, Queer Eye for the Straight Guy became a, a national phenomenon. And I remember when this, this show came out, it's about five gay guys giving makeovers to straight, <laughs> to clueless straight guys, right? And this was the first time, I remember, I, I, was, lit, I was in Bangkok at the time on a job, on a shoot. And I remember I told a friend of mine, a straight guy, a friend, uh, British guy, and I was like, this show is going to change everything. And it did. Because with Will and Grace, it was kind of like gay men loved it and women loved it. But this show was the first time, not only did gay men and women love it, but straight guys, the, the, the boyfriends and the husbands love this show. And so this show had a very powerful impact uh, in May of 2004, Massachusetts becomes the first state to legalize gay marriage. In 2005, Ang Lee directed Brokeback Mountain, Heath Ledger and Jake Gyllenhaal. And this, of course, this movie, and it won all kinds of awards, obviously. And um, Brokeback Mountain, I remember seeing it. And uh, it was, again, the power of storytelling. I mean, this, this was a powerful story about these, these two men in the 60s who were kind of lovers who couldn't really act on it because of the constraints of society. And so that Brokeback Mountain was uh, kind of a, a major moment in culture. And in 2011, New York passes, passes the Marriage Equality Act, becoming the largest state to legalize gay marriage. And then, of course, in 2015, the Obergefell decision, 5-4 decision of the Supreme Court, declares same-sex marriage legal in all 50 states. And so, mission accomplished. But maybe not. There's more. And to, in July of 2015, Bruce Jenner is on the cover of Vanity Fair as Caitlyn Jenner. 
And, and so that's kind of how we got to where we are today. But I want to read a, just a couple quotes from Carl Truman, his book, because I think these are really powerful. And he says that the narrative of modern sexual liberation feels compelling to so many of us because it is based on background beliefs of identity and freedom, which have been deeply instilled in us through cultural institutions for nearly three generations. He goes on to say, in our culture, sex is for individual fulfillment and self-realization. This modern view of identity is often called expressive individualism. The idea that deep within are feelings and desires that must be discovered and unlocked and expressed to become a true self. Identity is now found in one's desires. While in the past it was found in one's duties and relationships with God, family, community, determining and acting on your sexual desires is considered a key part of, the, of that process of becoming Rousseau, becoming an authentic person. Again, it's going back to the state of nature, back to your authentic self, being true to yourself. And he goes on to say, slogans such as be true to yourself and live your own truth are repeated in countless ways, verbal and nonverbal, and they sink deep into people's hearts. Any other view is seen as psychologically repressive and therefore unhealthy. So be true to yourself, live your truth, you be you, um, follow your heart. All of those slogans are, they're all products of, of the, these, uh, these philosophers and, and scientists and, uh, and so forth of, of, gen of centuries, centuries ago. And um, I mean, follow your heart is the worst advice you can ever give to a human being because our hearts are wicked and deceitful. So following your heart is the worst possible idea. Don't follow your heart, follow God. Like follow his heart, follow his word. That's what we need to follow. Because when you follow your heart, it leads to, I followed my heart for 20 years. And what did it lead me to? It led me to so much destruction, so much emotional pain, so much hurt. And by the way, so many of my friends, I mean, by the, there before the grace of God go I, by the grace of God, I never contracted HIV, even though my boyfriend came home one day and declared that he had HIV. I was like, what? And we were living together. And so many of my friends died of AIDS over the years. And so it's like following your heart is such a bad idea. And, you know, if you're in a heterosexual, you know, sexual relationship, following your heart is a terrible thing. It leads to so much pain and so much, um, you know, it can lead to all sorts of things. Unwanted pregnancy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so don't follow your heart ever, <laughs> unless it's aligned with God's will. And, and then finally, I'll end with this. He says, but the modern self is extremely fragile. We're very fragile, right? Because it is based on nothing but inward feelings, it is constantly changing from year to year and even month to month. Modern identity requires searching through ever-shifting and often contradictory emotions and desires to, discern, to determine a core self. So I'll leave it there and... Uh, but yeah, I just wanted to kind of give you a glimpse of, of how we got to this nutty place where we are today in culture. And so now let's, let's do some Q&A. Thank you guys for listening. All right. Well, Beckett, thank you so much. And thank you for sharing. And thank you for sharing your heart. And also for, you know, just being with us here. Let's oh, thank you. Why don't we back these up just a little bit, guys? Can we do that? Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. 
All right. We'll let you sit. You've been standing for a long oh, time. Oh, we'll, we'll, they'll, they'll get us chairs here in just a minute. Well, I want to encourage you as we are kind of shifting into the Q&A, I've got a list of questions here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Reese. Thank you, Tyler. This, uh, this has just been so helpful. Uh, and I've got a few of my own questions before we even get into the, the kind of some of the details that have been sent in. And I, I appreciate you sharing. And I, and, uh, I actually heard your podcast where you kind of went through this. Mm -hmm. And I was very disappointed because I was on a walk and I couldn't write it down. So I'm really thankful for you to repeat <laughs> it so that I could get my notes tidied up oh, here. Good. So it was awesome. Good. And uh, it's really helpful to see that this has been intentional, purposeful, and directed. We, we didn't get here by accident. Th this is not something that just happened overnight. And I say that to say, to get to somewhere else, we're gonna have to be intentional, purposeful, and directed. All right, so we're not gonna get here um, directly, but I, I, I wanna just but, you know, kinda hang in this area for just a minute, because really what I see in this, and, and part of my hope for us even having this weekend, and, uh, and having Beckett with us this weekend, is that what it's going to do is help equip us to better love people with real godly love. And what I mean by that is truth and love. And not allow the cultural influence of all of these different factors that are coming at us cause us to have misplaced compassion. And, and when I say misplaced compassion, because if we, if we align with the enemy's plan for somebody's life, but we say we're doing it because we care about them, that's misplaced compassion. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Instead of having real compassion, that's which right. is, I love you and you're amazing and God has created you for a purpose. And so the, the heart of this and the heart of what I'm taking away anyway, and, and I, I promise there's a question coming, and, but I'm a, <laughs> I'm a preacher and I get to preach today, so you gotta give me that. And so the, the heart of it is, first of all, you gotta eliminate God and then you gotta make, you gotta eliminate a godly purpose and replace it with a self purpose of I'm gonna find happiness for myself. Mm. And, uh, and so my, my question would be, uh, Beck, uh, Beck, how do we, how do we, as folks who maybe have not lived in the homosexual lifestyle, who that wasn't what we maybe struggled with growing up, you know, so to speak, in the, in the Lord, how do we express the right level of love, care, and compassion to our friends, our family, our coworkers, uh, but keeping it still where we, we stay on the, on the right place of, I love you and I care about you, but I'm not necessarily gonna affirm your lifestyle. So kind of talk yeah. into that just a little bit. Well, I did this, I, I did this one time. I, I read through the, the four gospels and I just really focused, I wanted to focus on how does Jesus interact with people? How does he interact with sinners and prostitutes and tax collectors and the woman at the well? What does he do? And Jesus is, he's the perfect model, obviously, of this. He, he, he was the, he, was the master at balancing grace and truth, at love and truth. And when he interacted with, like for example, um, the, uh, the tax collector, Z Zacchaeus. Um, was it, no, Le I'm sorry, Levi. Was it Levi in the booth? Yeah, Matthew, huh? Oh uh, yeah. So yeah, when he, Matthew, uh, when he's, he calls Matthew to come follow him and Matthew leaves his tax booth and follows him and there's a celebration. Uh, Matthew, Levi has a, a celebration at his house and, and a celebration is, in the Gospels is always a, a sign of repentance. But Jesus never leaves. Yes, he di Jesus dines with sinners, tax collectors, and prostitutes, but he never leaves them in that state. He, he always calls them out of that and calls them to repentance. Right. So he doesn't just... He's not just warm and fuzzy and says, oh, you just, just continue doing that. That's great for you. Um, he doesn't affirm their, their sin. He doesn't affirm their sin, but he loves them. He loves them too much to leave them in their sin. Right. right. That's why he calls them out. He's like, come follow me. I'm going to give you, to, at the woman at the well who had, had four ex-husbands and was living with a man, he's like, I'm the living water. I can give you water and you'll never thirst again. And that's, that's what he offers. <laughs> and it's like, and it's true. Once you drink the living water of Christ, you don't, you don't want any of that stuff anymore. 
Um, you don't want any of the, of the dirty tap water. You want like the real living water of Christ. And so at the woman at the well, you know, he doesn't leave her there. He, he's, he calls her out on her sin. He's like, actually, you have, you have uh, four. Was it four or five? Five. Five. You have five ex-husbands that you're living with somebody now. And um, he calls her out and she repents. And um, so I just, I think it's, yeah, like you said, Thinking that affirming someone's, uh, aff being gay affirming or being LGBTQ affirming, if you think that's loving, it's, it's actually the opposite of loving. It's, you're actually aiding and abetting someone, I mean, I, <laughs> you're aiding and abetting someone on the path to eternal destruction. That's what you're actually doing. So what, what actually is, so, and it's called hate speech to, you know, say that homosexual behavior is a sin that's in our culture is called hate speech. It's actually love speech. That's, that's right. right. Because you're loving someone enough. Those people in the coffee shop loved me enough to tell me that homosexual behavior was a sin. They were, they, they loved me that much and invited me to their church and God did the rest. But yeah, far from, from, from hate speech, it's, it's love speech. That's and we have to, just I talk about this in my book, but as you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were, were, in, uh, were aliens in Babylon. They were in a different culture, and, but they were, they were God's people, and they knew, the, they knew God's word. They knew his commandments, and when Nebuchadnezzar built a gold, you know, giant golden statue and had all the, official from, the officials from the provinces come to bow down to the statue... They refused to bow down to the culture. They refused to bow down to the statue because they, and, and they even knew that there was a fiery furnace waiting for them to be thrown into. And they were threatened twice with it and they still refused to cave to culture. And as Christians, we have to be loving. We have to love. Obviously, Jesus said all the command, com commandments can be summed up in two commandments. Love God and love your neighbor. So we're called to love our neighbor, our gay neighbor. So love as generously as you can, but do not cave to culture. Do not cave to this issue. And so, uh, yeah, I, have, I think no, that's that awesome. And, and, and what I love too is, because the woman in the well is my favorite story in the Bible. These people know that, but you, you didn't know that as you bring it up. So, and she goes back into the city and says, come, let me show you a man who's told me everything I ever did. And obviously he didn't show her everything he, she ever did. But because she saw his real love and loving her for who she is without accepting her of her failings, it opened her up to everything. And mm -hmm. so this, so just, uh, did you have something there? No. Okay. So help us take this a step further to this concept of purpose. So when we see the history here of shifting, you know, we would know as Christians, God gives us our purpose. We were, we were created on yes. purpose for a purpose and that purpose comes from God. Yeah. So outside of God, how, how can we help people find God and find and, and identify that purpose? Is there, you have any insight or any thoughts for us? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, as I say all the time, you know, I lived in a postmodern world for 42 years. Before I came to Christ, before I came to faith in Christ, I was living in this postmodern world. I had, no, I had no purpose. I had no idea what was right or wrong, what was up or down. You know, I, I would go to parties and... I would just be like, well, I guess, you know, I'm, I guess I can go into that room and I, there's nothing wrong with it, really. Um, and I never, and I'm telling you, the, the burden of postmodernism is so heavy. It's a heavy burden to bear. And so when you know the truth, when God, <laughs> God revealed this truth to me and I understood finally the, perp the meaning of life and the purpose, my purpose in life, to glorify him and enjoy him forever, uh, it was such a huge relief to me. It was like this giant, it's like Pilg Pilgrim's Progress when the thing, the giant weight falls off of him. Uh, it, this giant weight just fell off of me. And it was like, oh my gosh, I've never felt this light in my life. <laughs> and so, um, I mean, I, in terms of ministering to people in the culture about this, I, 
all you can do is love them and share the gospel with them and share the truth with them, God's word. Because God's word, this is living and active. It's, it's living and active. And if you, if you share this God's word, it can pierce the heart. And so, yeah. good. So good. Yeah. Well, in po postmodernism, everything is subjective. Yes. So it's sold as such a great thing. This is freedom. You get to be your own God. You get to decide what's good for you. Mm -hmm. But then recognizing it's a weight to bear, that we were never created to even bear. So when you speak of the relief and the comfort to know, oh, there is a God, yeah. and he is God, and I am not. Yeah. So therefore, I don't have to carry this heaviness, this weightiness that you were experiencing. So I just think it's so it's interesting how sinister this plan has been of the enemy yeah. to portray everything as this is so good, you know, will and grace. This is funny, these people are great. You know, I like to watch it because I like to laugh, you know, um, and it seems like everything is so okay. Or yeah, well, follow your own truth, be your own, follow your own way. But then recognizing when you are living that for 20 years, no, longer, Yeah. longer, all of your high life. School. Yeah, <laughs> since high school. Since really. you started, you know, going to bars at 15, which yeah. I'm like, how did you do, even do that? I don't know. <laughs> I, don't know. Um, I can tell you but, later, but I can't uh, say oh, it now. Oh, 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 no, oh, no. <laughs> so, okay, there are ways, apparently. So, for that length of time, you're, I mean, you're truly like, been there, done that. Yeah. And it was not enjoyable. And I don't ever want to go back to Egypt, ever. Exactly. I don't want to go back to bondage, because I've been there. And that, I mean, you see the results today. I mean, young kids, teenagers are uh, suicidal, depressed, uh, self, they self-harm. There's so much, because of postmodernism, because there's no objective reality, no objective truth, you can create your own reality. Because of Jacques Derrida, again, well, Jacques Derrida was Algerian, but basically French, and Michel Foucault, who is French, because of these postmodernist guys, this is all, all of this is coming home to roost now with, with postmodernism. And, and, and again, this is, this is why we see so much um, angst and anxiety in, in young yes. people in our culture. And it's, 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 again, it's just this, it's a weight that these kids cannot bear. And that's why they're, they're having meltdowns and freaking out. Yeah. Good. Well, so here we've got a question then that kind of goes along this. Could you help us with some actual words we can use in a real life scenario? <laughs> in other words, can, can somebody call you? Have somebody that you need to call? I think is what it really comes down to. But if you could just, if you were just sitting down, if it, if you if you flip the roles, you're in your coffee shop, you've got your Bible, somebody comes up to the table, I'm a gay man. Why are you reading the Bible? What what do you say to him? Well, it's ha this this happened one time. Uh, this was, it was an amazing moment. This guy, so this guy um, was born in Iraq. He was Iraqi, and, but he was a refugee. I think when he was seven years old, his family fled to Sweden. And then he ends up in Los Angeles. He comes to LA. And he ends up becoming a very successful business person in LA. And Somehow he got a hold of my number or some, someone connected, I can't remember, but he contacted me and he said, can we meet up? Because at this point in his life, he was a drug addict. He was on, he was on Grindr, having, he was having sex with eight different guys a night on Grindr. And um, he was addicted to all sorts of things. And he, so I said, yes, let's meet at a coffee shop. <laughs> it's always the coffee shop. And, uh, it was an incredible moment because I, all I did was I told him my story. Mm -hmm. And when I, I told him my whole story and I was so stunned at the end of it, he was just, tears were just streaming down his face. And I said, you know, you should say his name was Sam. I said, come to, come to my church tomorrow night with me. So he came to my church the following night and uh, during the sermon, he was sitting right next to me, but I didn't, I wasn't, I didn't look at him because I didn't want to make him feel awkward. Yeah. So, but I, so I heard during the whole sermon, I heard kind of like, like he was crying. I heard him crying basically. And I was like, what is going on with Sam? And by the end of the sermon, 
or by the end of the service, the lights, you know, everything comes on. I look over at him and his entire shirt is covered in tears, like drenched in tears. And that day, I mean, he was like, everything changed in his world. He like was on fire. He still is on fire for Jesus. He saw, <laughs> he went wild. He like sold everything. He, he only saved a, one pair of every single thing he had, a pair of shoes, a pair, like one thing. He sold his condo in West Hollywood. Uh, he moved back to Sweden actually. And he like lives in a one room like a thing. And, and he, now he, he was a hugely successful business person in LA. And now he drives a cab in Sweden. And all he does is like read the Bible all day. I mean, he's obsessed. Yeah. So wow. it just like transformed him. But what I would say to somebody, in a, if someone said that to me in a coffee shop, I, I would just say, I, for, I would just, you, it's like the book of Hebrews. Jesus is better. Jesus is better than the angels. Jesus is the better sacrifice. Jesus, Jesus is better than anything else this world has to offer. And, and you can go into to some, some passages and, and kind of preach out of those passages or talk about those passages in the Bible. But that, I think that's the, one of the keys is, 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 show, is trying to, to show someone First of all, it's telling them what the gospel is, because that's right. the most important thing. Because the gospel, what is it? gospel means good news. And what do you do with news? You announce the news. So you need to announce what the good news is. And so share the gospel, but try to show uh, the person how much better Jesus is than, than anything in this world. Yeah. And, and if, if we don't have a testimony like your testimony, we all have a testimony. Yeah, that we can share. Of course. We can always say, this is where I was without Jesus. Yeah. Jesus met me here and here's where I am. You know, we overcome the devil by the, you know, the blood of the lamb, the word of our testimony and not loving our own lives even unto death. And so right. anyway, amen just, to that. Thank you. So just appreciate you. So here's another question and I'm going to, I'm going to, by the way, I mean, I'll just say yeah. just in terms of, I always say this, like happiness is overrated. Happiness is fleeting. <laughs> It's all based on your circumstances. I was always, I mean, I was up and down in my life. There was like, sometimes I was happy if I, my boyfriend, you know, if I had a boyfriend and my career was going well, but if it wasn't, I was like depressed. And it was so, it fluctuated like crazy. But now I, because of the joy that comes with knowing Christ and having the Holy Spirit indwelling you, the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, yeah. that joy never goes away. No matter what my circumstances are, um, that joy never goes away. <laughs> and it's like, I think of, I just thought of this. I, Paul, okay, so Paul, Paul the apostle, you know, he had so much joy and he had a really rough life. Paul was single. He didn't, Paul didn't think about his life as like, woe is me. What about, you know, my happiness? What about me? This is, Paul, all he cared about was running around the Mediterranean, sharing, <laughs> spreading the gospel and planting churches. And this is what he said in 2 Corinthians. He says, five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and, sea, a night and day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, and toil and hardship through many a sleepless night in hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. But do you think Paul thought his life was, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about this, because you think Paul thought his life was unfair? No. And that's what people ask me all the time. They're like, isn't it unfair that you have to be single and celibate for the rest of your life? And I'm like, are you kidding me? I have eternal life. I have a relationship with the king of the universe. That's right. My life, <laughs> what's, I never forever, not for a split second since in the last 13 years have I ever felt like I've been cheated out of something or my life is unfair. I feel like the luckiest guy in the world. I don't believe in luck, but I feel like the luckiest guy in the world. And what's unfair is Jesus had to be beaten, crucified, and tortured for my sin. That's unfair. Thank you. My life, I, I'm, I'm like, I can't even believe, I can't fathom that I I mean, can you really fathom eternal life? Eternal, that's a long time, right? An eternal life with, 
No, no, no more weeping, no more crying, no tears, no death, no, no sin anymore, nothing. It's, it's absolute, it is a utopia and it's that's bliss. Right. So, I mean, that's like, I, I, yeah, I can't, I don't understand how anyone could think they're, if they're in Christ, how their life is unfair or if, because that it's the most incredible thing that could ever happen yeah. in your life. Awesome. Well, and, that, and you really kind of answered another question. Here was the question, is the goal for a person who was in a homosexual uh, state or a homosexual person to become heterosexual? And I think you just answered that beautifully. No, the goal is for them to become holy. Holy. Yeah. Exactly. Get yeah. I mean, God. the goal is not the goal of you know if yeah the goal is not to become a heterosexual. That's not my goal. Obviously, God he created the universe. He can change that in me, and he could make me attracted to a woman. That's fine. I'm totally open to that. But the goal is holiness, is sanctification, right? And uh, is dying to oneself every day and and living for Christ. And so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, so here's another question. How should someone come out for help and how should the church respond? And I, I'm assuming we're, we're talking about coming out of that lifestyle. So if somebody says, hey, I just, I would like help, what would be the, what would be the right response for the, for the church? Yeah, I mean, I, by the way, I've been meaning to say this all day. I mean, if, if someone is here and they struggle with this issue, I have nothing, we have nothing but love and compassion for you. It's very, I know it's a very powerful, strong thing to deal with. I, I, I get it, <laughs> obviously, I get it. And so the best thing is to share, if you haven't talked to anyone about it, uh, to share with someone you choose, a pastor or someone in the church you trust. And because we're the body of Christ, we're, we are to bear one another's burdens. And, and Satan loves to work in the dark. So if, you, if you're not talking to anyone about this and you're hiding it, Satan loves to condemn you and work in the dark and do all that. But if you come out to someone in your, if you come out and talk to people in your church or, or your pastors, that's where that you bring it out into the light. And that's where people can pray for you and, 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 and help you along in this journey. We're all on this road to the celestial city. We're all pilgrims on this road to the celestial city and we need help from the body of Christ. And yes. so that's what I would, I would urge people to do. So you wouldn't, ex you wouldn't recommend that somebody just comes out on social media? No, no, or... not really, no. Um, yeah, I think it, I mean, I, I, at the time I, you know, because I was very public at the very, when I first became a Christian, but it was kind of like the, the jig is up. I mean, people already knew that, you know, I was gay for so long. So it, was, it wasn't a coming out thing. But uh, no, I don't recommend that. I, cause I, I think it's better to, to do it kind of slowly and, and with just certain people you trust in the church. So what advice would you have for parents or grandparents to help children from falling into homosexuality? Not necessarily coming out, but to kind of keep their kids from, in, in the culture, right? With a culture that is so uh, leaning that way to where even now in a lot of schools, the, the culture is, you know, if you, if you say that you're, you know, I, I feel like I'm a woman in a man's body, all of a sudden you have a support group, all of a sudden you're kind of a protected class, Celebrated even, yeah. So, so do you have any advice for parents or grandparents? Uh, it's tough. I mean, this is the toughest period in history in terms of this issue, and it's. I think it's. It's so hard on parents. I've I've talked to many, many, many parents and grandparents about this, and the thing is, because the culture is so powerful and social media is so dominant, and and and. You know, television, movies are so dominant on with this issue. It's really hard to protect your child from that because it's it's you it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. I mean, you can't escape it. And unless just you move to some farm in the middle of Montana or something, do that. Yeah, I would say do that. Yeah, just move to a farm. <laughs> but um, but it's hard. I you know I would I would definitely restrict. I mean, if I had kids, I would restrict. I wouldn't let them have a smartphone until they were 18. <laughs> I would just restrict, like, no computer. I mean, they would have a computer for a school, I guess. But, like, no, you know, nothing like that. Because it's, it's uh, social media, I, I, it's one of, 
you know, I, there are some good things about it, but I think it's one of Satan's masterpieces because he's got us so distracted and so deceived by all this stuff coming at us all the time. And I always say, like, if you, you know, if we, instead of looking at Instagram, oh, sorry, I'm looking at your phone. <laughs> I won't look Just at your personal ahead. details. Just... Um, instead of looking at Instagram, Oh, wow, that's a weird picture. Uh, just kidding. Um, you better show them. <laughs> it's just reminding me to eat. <laughs> um, instead of looking at social media, if we, instead of tapping on Instagram, if we just tapped on the Bible app and just and for those like 10 minutes or five minutes read a verse, a, a passage from the Bible, think how, how, how stronger our faith would be, how much stronger our faith would be, how more shaped by the, the word we would be. I mean, it's hard to do. I'm not saying it's easy. I preach it to myself. This is difficult stuff. Yeah. But in retrospect, I, I mean, I wish none of these apps were ever invented. And, and I've heard you say on your podcast, and forgive me, I'm, this isn't a test. I just literally can't remember. Um, there's a specific app, especially for some transgender issues for young kids that they are... Tumblr is... is Tumblr. Tumblr is like... And Reddit are places where, where kids go, especially young girls, go to... to um, for transgender kind of stuff. And they, as soon as you're on Tumblr, I mean, this happened to uh, a, a young girl, Helena uh, Kirshner, yeah. Uh, as soon as you go onto Tumblr and you say you're trans, I mean, immediately you've got thousands of people just sur supporting you and saying, go do it, do it, do it. Like go get the testosterone, get the top surgery, go. And so it's, it's like this wild, wild culture of, um, uh, and it's so, yeah, it's just, it's bizarre. It's really bizarre. And uh, I recommend reading Abigail Schreier's book, Irreversible Damage. She's not a Christian, but she wrote a book on trans, and, and she says that, you know, this, these young girls, these teenage girls, in, in the past, they would resort to bulimia or anorexia to kind of deal with the angst of grow, becoming a teenager or and then it became cutting and now it's becoming trans and this is re irreversible i just interviewed someone for my show two a couple days ago and she she became trans and had top she had a double mastectomy she did the whole thing testosterone double mastectomy and and then she had total regret, and then she ended up coming to faith in Christ, yeah. which is amazing. And so she's going to be on she'll, the shows this coming Thursday. But uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's just a, it's a wild time in culture. And so I think it's also so important. I mean, you joke about your you being the youngest of eight children, and so your parents were just like you know they kind of forgot about you and what it was that you were doing, <laughs> but. You make a good point in stating that you were making good grades, you were social, so you're a good kid. And so for parents to be, recognize and be aware, I mean, there could have, and so no condemnation on your parents or anyone, I'm, I'm not saying that, but just pointing out as parents, I've heard sometimes parents will say, well, I don't want them to think I don't trust them. So they won't check a phone. Um, or they don't have proactive things in place, mm -hmm. like we put up our phones at night or whatever, or anyone can see what I have, or nobody has computers in their rooms. Screens are always so that someone can see them. Some of those things are um, just helpful boundaries yeah. that just are proactive, that keep us help us to make some right, wise decisions so that a child doesn't continue to go down a trajectory for a long time without some intervention. Yeah, but I mean, just think about my life. My parents were, were not <clears throat> really <laughs> that aware of what was going on in my life and that I was going to gay bars starting at 14. But, and then I moved to Los Angeles and of all places in Hollywood, California, I... I get saved. Now, what are the chances of that? So when the hound of heaven is coming after you, there's no escaping. You're gonna, he's gonna, he's gonna get you. So I always talk about this with parents. Just know that God is sovereign and that just keep praying over your grandchildren and children and God is, God's gonna do his thing. He's gonna be the hound of heaven and chase these people down, chase your kids down and grab them and bring them back to himself. Yeah, so no, that's, that's really good.
And because I think a lot of times what we want is a magic pill. Yeah. If you, if you could just give me the three words that I need to say to unlock their heart and, you know, get them out of their darkness. But we, we got to know that God loves our children more than we do. And he loves our grandchildren more than we do. Yeah, and the thing is, like, I kind of, I mean, I, I don't, I don't know how to word this really, but it's almost like I had to go, th I had to be the prodigal to really understand grace. You know, I was, I was the crazy prodigal son and out of all my siblings, I really, I understand grace more than they do because they were Christians at a very young age and <laughs> I was the crazy prodigal. So I really get God's grace, but yeah, that's good. So th there's a couple of questions kind of in the same vein. So I'm gonna try to combine a couple of them. And you know, there's, you know, there's been a historical response generally from some in the church about kind of the hellfire and brimstone around homosexuality. You know, homosexuality for years was called out as a, uh, a, a unique sin from some of the other sins possibly and, and dealt with maybe a little more harshly. Uh, and then another kind of com combination of that, it seems like a lot of church trauma caused by the Christian community has, uh, is a shared and prevalent topic in the gay community. There are some gays who were involved with churches that claim to be evangelical. How can the seemingly impenetrable church hurt perceived by a gay person be overcome? In other words, there, there are, you know, so there are affirming churches now. Um, but then generally speaking, you know, uh, somebody that grew up in the church, they probably know where the church stands on the issue of homosexuality. And, and sometimes are like, well, hey, these people accept me. Why don't you? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I didn't have that experience, really, of kind of growing up in the church and, and being in that environment. So it's hard for me to really speak on that. But I, from what I can, and I don't want to say a blanket statement like this, but I will. <laughs> but I think a lot of the church hurt is just from being called out on your sin. Like, that's now become... That's, that's, you're harming me. You're, that's, that's spiritual abuse. If I right. call you, if I say, hey, Jimmy, you know, you can't sleep with other guys. That's not, that's not glorifying to God. It's, it's, uh, it's actually sinful. Then that's, to, you could say, well, that's spiritual abuse. And that's, you've hurt me. The church has hurt me. And I see that so often in the church. And I know there actually is real abuse. So I, I'm not discounting that. But I'm just saying, in our culture now, everything is abuse. Everything is <laughs> <laughs> assault and abuse and sex. like it's all abuse and so we have to be aware of that too right and just calling people out on you know saying not calling them out in a mean way but just saying hey right you know in the, in the biblical way in Matthew and we're calling someone say hey you know this is this is sinful and we need to deal with this um that can people can interpret that as as church hurt which is the same as the neo-marxism yeah. Which is the whole thing with Rousseau. It's like, I take no responsibility. It's everybody else who has caused me yeah, of pain. Course. Yes. So there's no responsibility. The church is the oppressor. Yes. I am the oppressed. Now that's how I get all this self-pity. Yes. So, yeah. yeah. And victimology. Victimology, as, as I read in After the Ball, that's a huge deal. It's, it's like being a victim is, is so celebrated in our culture and it's something to aspire to. <laughs> so I, it's like, what can I, how can I be a victim? I want to be a sexual minority. Like, that's what I want to be. And I'm going to call myself a sexual minority. It's like, no, you're just actually in sexual sin, but that's okay. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Well, that, that's really good. And so kind of, let's take that another step because you know the, the drama triangle, right? So the idea of persecutor and savior and victim. So, so the moment I can make myself a victim and I can make somebody else the persecutor, it leaves open the vacuum for somebody to come and rescue me. Yeah. And there's a huge thing that's happening in our culture today where, you know, I think a lot of the studies have been done, the gen the, specifically kind of the lower end or the younger Gen Xers and then, of course, the Gen Z that are coming up behind them, you know, the, the gay rights movement has become their civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. So it's, there's, there's been, they've done such a good job of projecting victim that now there's a whole group, a whole, a whole demographic that is trying to save them. Mm -hmm. right. uh, so what, what do we say to these so-called saviors, you know, in love as a way of like, hey, I don't know that you're... Uh, Get behind me, Satan. I don't know what to, <laughs> what to say to them. I mean, there are, there's too many of them. Um, 
Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't mean collectively, <laughs> like one-on-one. -on -one. We're, we're in a coffee shop again. Well, I, I can relay, again, I won't use names, but Kim and I were at a, a Christian event, uh -huh. and we're sitting next to a, a Christian gentleman sitting right where you were sitting. And uh, we're having a little break, and we're having these conversations. We're obviously, obviously all Christians. We're all in the room together. It's a bunch of kind of uh, business folks and pastors and stuff together. And we're talking about how do we, you know, change the world sort of thing. And this conversation of homosexuality comes up. And this individual had a huge sympathy towards the homosexual movement. So much so he said, well, I just think we just need to love people. And so you could tell that he, had, he felt as if it was his Christian responsibility to defend the oppressed class. Right. And obviously we would Well, that's what I, I just read that out of the playbook from right. after the ball. They said we need, you know, protectors from, you know, we need to f be victims so the, the straight world will be our protector. Mm -hmm. And it's wor it worked. <laughs> These guys were smart. Um... Is this guy a, a, a minister, a pastor? Uh, he's in business, but he would be an elder. At okay. Church. So, a, a yeah, I mean, but he's saying, is he saying we need to be loving in terms, and meaning we need to be gay affirming in our church? Um, I don't know that he took it quite that far, but basically saying, look, I think we just need to talk more about love. It, it, it would be the progressive agenda. It would be straight. Yeah, you can't, you, you could never separate the spirit from the word, and you can never separate grace from truth. If you went, once you separate those two things, That's you're either going to be a legalist or an antinomian. Like there's no, you can't ever separate the two things. That's right. That's and that's why exactly. this, these, this idea of like, oh, we just need to love. No, actually, you need to speak the truth in love. There's truth as well, not just love. Right. Good. So, Perfect. No, that's that's exactly what I was getting to. So thank you. That was that's it. Good. You did good. It was awesome. That's so good. So, and we're, we're kind of running low on time here, so I just want to ask, there, there's kind of another thread, so I'm going to kind of okay. sum of these together, and that would be this. What was the impact on your life, uh, professionally and otherwise, when you became a Christian, and it changed your life, and you published your book? Yeah, well, I, I mean, at first, when I, when I became a Christian, I was wild on the set. I would be on the set, I, as I mentioned before, at Paris Hilton's house, or on, with Oprah, or just all these, you know, actresses in Hollywood or Katy Perry. I was actually on this shoot, on this shoot with Katy Perry and her wardrobe stylist, John, uh, Johnny Wujek. He was a friend of mine. But Johnny was, was is, he's gay. And um, he, uh, you know, I saw him for the first time after I got saved. And I was like, Johnny, oh my gosh, I'm a Christian now. And this is crazy. Like, Jesus is real. And, and we had this whole kind of like 30-minute talk. And finally, Katy Perry comes out on the balcony. She's like, okay, guys, the Bible study's over. Can we get to work? Um, but I was wild. I would talk about Jesus on the set of every shoot I was on. I didn't care. I was completely fearless. Because it's, again, it's like finding a treasure in a field. And it's like, you guys, there's this crazy treasure in a field. If you just go there, <laughs> you can get it. And... Um, and so I thought every job that I was, I was on, I thought, okay, this is my last job because my agent is going to find out about this and I'm going to be re reported to my agent and I'm going to lose my career. And that never happened. I actually kept getting more and more jobs. God had this kind of uh, grace over this long period of, with me with, in terms of my career. But when my book came out in 2019, that's when the stuff hit the fan. And... Uh, and that's when I got canceled in Hollywood. I got blacklisted, and, and I, uh, I got dropped from my agency, and uh, no one, the phone stopped ringing. But I, like I said, it, I, I think I've mentioned this before to you, but I, I, I didn't care because I knew that God, because God called me to seminary in 2014, and I knew he was preparing me for something else, for full, kind of a full-time ministry stuff. So when I, when I lost my agent, when I lost my career, I was like, okay, cool. So God closed that door. He's going to open another door. And he did. Like, he's, he's faithful. And when you're, that's the thing. When you're obedient to God, he's so faithful. He's just faithful. And he, he's never, he's never going to leave or forsake you. And he's going right. to take care of you. So, yeah. Awesome. 
Can I just say, you know, when we were talking about love and the redefinition of love that... Love um, is love. You know, it, it, that, yeah. <laughs> well, what does that mean to you? So I love going to the Word of God. And so 1 Corinthians 13 yes. says, love does not delight in evil. So anything that's evil, wicked, dark, ugly, perverse, immoral, that's not love. Yes. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. So that is so powerful to remember that, okay, no, there really is truth. And if I'm going to love someone, I'm going to embrace the truth. I want them to have truth in their lives. So it doesn't yeah. just say, hey, um, well, there, what is truth? There really is no truth. Well, then that's not love. Yeah. Because love truly does rejoice in the truth. That's right. And so... It doesn't rejoice in wrongdoing, as no, my translation exactly, says. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, that, that, and that's love is love is a tautology. It's it's completely gibberish. It's postmodern gibberish. It's like <laughs> defining a word by the same word. It's like a chair is a chair. That doesn't mean anything. And the subtext of that tautology, love is love, is you are affirming the LGBTQ movement. That's what love is love really means. And. And again, as you said, Paul defi Paul actually, in, in the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians, defines what love is. Love is patient, love is kind, et cetera, et cetera. And it doesn't rejoice at wrongdoing, but it rejoices in the truth. So it's, that's what love really is. We actually have a definition of love in the Bible. And it's real. <laughs> it's not yeah. postmodernist. And, and perfect love casts out all fear. So because you had an encounter with love, because God is love, mm -hmm. that, and his love filled your heart, it cast out that fear, mm -hmm. so you became fearless. Yeah, it was, yeah. So totally I just fearless. wonder, I mean, if we could just even pray, God, fill our hearts with so much love that we would be fearless mm -hmm. in sharing our faith and then recognizing that the fruit of the Holy Spirit, I mean, a couple, love and joy and peace, I mean, you can keep going, but even joy in recognizing because Holy Spirit came in and filled your heart and wrecked you and you know, messed you up in yeah. the best way, then you have joy, and that joy is contagious, and that is such an indicator of the work, the transformational work of Jesus Christ and his filling of Holy Spirit. And so that is what is so amazing that we get to walk in, and I just appreciate so much uh, yeah, yeah. that about you, Beckett, is that you have so much joy. It is sincere. It's not manufactured, and it can only come from God truly making you your authentic self, exactly. who you were created yes. to be, who he created you to be, as you're created in his image. And we're just so grateful for the amazing work of redemption that God's done in you, and we just bless you, and thank you for yeah. coming. Thank you, can we just thank God? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Becca, for being with us. And so we've, we've got some more questions, and what we're going to try to do is, is we may, Kim and I may tackle some of these actually in an upcoming podcast that we can try to help go through these. These are amazing questions. We're not going to lose these. So if you didn't get your question answered, know that we're going to try to get that answered to you. We're so thankful to you. We're so thankful for you, Beckett. Let me just pray for us, and we'll close the evening. Father, we're so thankful for you. We're thankful for your redemptive grace, and we're thankful for the love that you have for us, and we're thankful that, for God, you so loved the world that you gave Jesus your mm -hmm. son to come here and die for our sins that we might be forgiven, yes. that we might be able to experience the life that you have for us yes. so that we can have the salvation, that we can have the empowering grace, that we can live in eternity with you and have a life that is empowered by your spirit. So Father, I just pray your blessings on all of us, blessings on our church as we head out. And Lord Jesus, I pray for every single one of us. Father, I pray that as you've brought conviction to any of our hearts about any area that is not in alignment with the perfection of your will, Father, we come to you and we repent. We repent of any of our sins, anywhere that we have not been aligned with you, anywhere where we have bought the lie of postmodernism, the lie of the enemy that says that truth is not absolute. Father, we repent of that. We submit 
uh, any of our beliefs to your truth, to your way, to your life, that we would experience the abundant life that only comes through you, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. I pray for fresh ways to surrender. Lord, we surrender to you in a fresh way this evening and for loved ones, God, and, and anyone here this evening who is struggling with their sexuality and their identity. Father, we just come before you. We humble ourselves before you and we say, God, we are not God, but you are, Jesus Christ. We thank you that you came and you made a way for us to be forgiven, healed, set free, and transformed. So Lord, we thank you for the cross and the precious blood of Jesus that cleanses us. And thank you, Father, that we get to be made new creations. I pray that everyone who walks out tonight would know you, Jesus, as Lord and Savior, mm -hmm. that we would be filled fresh and new with you, Holy Spirit, that every single day of our lives, our minds would be renewed and bound to your mind. Father, we want to honor you with our lives. So we pray for any of our loved ones and anybody that we know who is not walking with you, we pray, Father, that you will reveal your love to them and draw them to your heart, that they would be saved and they would experience your kingdom here on the earth and eternally in heaven. Thank you for Beckett and the beautiful work you've done in his life. We bless him and bless this church family. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 We love you guys. Amen. You guys have great leaders, by the way. <laughs> You're lucky.